So, um, my name is Chad Thomas. Uh, I'm an archaeologist and I've been uh, most of my time uh, in my research efforts on looking at Mississippi and, and uh, especially the uh, peoples here in Asia. Uh, the one thing that I really focused my research on was looking at the artwork and the symbols and motifs that are used in Mississippian artwork as a way of communicating ideas, uh, a way of getting at the into the minds of the people and understanding what ideas that they felt were important enough to talk to one another about. Uh, one of the things that we wanted to do with these afternoon talks uh, this year is give you a sense of what uh, what we professional archaeologists talk and what we talk about with one another. And so what I'm going to read for you today is uh, a research paper that I originally presented at uh, the Midwest Archaeological Conference a couple of years ago on uh, this cross and circle motif and angel mounds. Uh, anyone who is familiar with Native American art, uh, whether historic or prehistoric Native American art, should be familiar with the cross and circle motif. And this is it. It's a very simple geometric design. At least um, the core idea is very simple and geometric. It was made across very large swaths of North America uh, for thousands of years both before and after the people um, uh, settled here at Angel Mounds. And it was probably made for very uh, widely different cultural groups, for different reasons, with different meanings, throughout that very long span of time. Now, archaeologists trying to interpret this symbol, uh, the interpretation that they offer vary from this idea that it is a sun circle. This is one of the older ideas. Um, and so this is an excerpt from a, you can see, a 1945 article showing all the different variations that they have identified on this idea of the sun circle. The idea being that all these variations in some way mean the sun. So anytime you see this, these archaeologists interpret it as a symbol for the sun. Now other archaeologists interpret this same symbol as a cosmogram, a depiction of the structure of the universe. And this quotation shows uh, that, very, that very well. It is also reasonable to assume that the circle and cross motif of the Southeastern Ceremonial Complex represents this world, the four directions and the center. That is, it's not the upper world of the sky, it is north, south, east, west. Um, these are interpretations that archaeologists have offered. Contemporary Native American groups say that this symbol is not in itself a representation directly of the four directions. They say this is a depiction of the medicine wheel. And the medicine wheel is a real three-dimensional object that is made, that is used in ceremonies by uh, many Native American groups. But the medicine wheel itself involves that north, south, east, west, four direction symbol. So in some cases we have archaeologists saying it is a symbol of the sky. Some cases we have archaeologists saying it's a symbol of this world. In some cases we have Native Americans saying it's not a symbol of anything, it's just a drawing of something that is itself a symbol. But the problem here is trying to understand what it meant to the people who made it in uh, angel artwork a thousand years ago. Uh, none of these three interpretations necessarily tells us what the angel artists meant. Now, in the late prehistory of the eastern woodlands of North America, the period when Angel was occupied, the motif is most closely associated with these Mississippian cultures, like the people who lived here at Angel Mounds. Um, and specifically with peoples in this Mississippian culture who participated in the Southeastern Ceremonial Complex. Uh, which is a set of rituals and beliefs and ideas that were shared across many sites and many towns in the Mississippian world about the cosmos, about leadership, um, and along with those ideas came particular styles of art. Now, scholarly opinion these days is sort of drifting away from the idea that the Southeastern Ceremonial Complex represents a coherent set of religious beliefs. Uh, what we think is happening now, having learned some more about the, uh, the artwork and the ideas that were involved, is that rather than a coherent set of religious beliefs, we actually have sort of a mishmash of a whole variety of traditions and beliefs 
that earlier archaeologists misinterpreted as being a set of unit uh, ideas. Uh, nevertheless, whether or not the southeastern ceremonial complex is a real thing, the circle and cross motif is a very important motif in all Mississippian artwork, and it's especially important here at Angel Mounds. In the 1930s and 1940s, Glenn Black, the fellow here on the, the poster to the side, uh, was the first archaeologist to excavate here at Angel Mounds. And in the for course of a few years as he worked here, he excavated 144 individual artifacts that have this circle and cross motif in, on them, in one manner or another. Um, and that is a very stark contrast to other comparable Mississippian sites excavated in the same time period. Moundville in Alabama is actually a larger town than Angel ever was. And in the entire Depression era collection, there are only 47 examples of a cross and circle. Kincaid is a town uh, just across the Ohio River from what is now Paducah, Kentucky, which was of a comparable size to Angel, and has traditionally been understood as Angel's twin city. And yet, in its entire collection are only 17 artifacts. So the artists who made this uh, art at Angel were making it much, much more, much more commonly, and many more variations on many more different kinds of artifacts than at any of these other sites. The only conclusion that we can draw from that is that whatever this symbol means, it meant something special to the people at Angel. And it meant something different to them than it did at any of these other sites. So if we can understand what it meant to the people at Angel, we can begin to use that as uh, in any number of ways to help us understand other aspects of Angel uh, life, of politics at the site, of what they felt was important. Now the important question here is, how can we tell what a symbol in art means to someone who made the art a thousand years ago or more? Now there are a variety of approaches to this, and a variety of different schools of thought as to how we can tease meaning out of archaeological materials. The one that I would uh, argue is probably going to be most useful to us, at least in this case, is to make an analogy with written language. You see, these symbols and these motifs and this artwork, and we'll see many examples of it here in a, in a few minutes, but uh, this artwork was clearly meant to communicate something. It was meant that for an audience to see that art and see the picture and get a message out of it. What we want to know is what the message was. Well, we have a written language in our society. If we want to communicate a complex message, we simply write it out. The Native Americans here at Angel Mounds were illiterate, or pre-literate, if you like. Uh, they had no writing system, but the visual art that they could produce uh, was the closest thing that they had for communicating these very complex messages. So basically, a technique, any technique and ideas that we can take for understanding written language and translate them to these symbols can help us understand what the artists meant. So for example, the word fat, by adding a very small, seemingly unimportant structural element to this word, we can actually change it to a very different meaning. Wow, makes sense. Well, the only addition here is that bottom bar. So we made a very small structural change that made a very large change in meaning. And I would argue then uh, that what we as archaeologists see as a single symbol or a single motif can, in fact, to the original audience, have been several or multiple motifs with different meanings because of the addition or subtraction of something that we see as rather unimportant. Now, the flip side of this is that here we have the word cat and the word dog. These two words are written in the same font, so they, they have the same style. But they are very structurally different. The shapes of the letters and the number of elements there are very different. So 
while a change in the structure can change the meaning, that doesn't necessarily mean that the style has to change. And the flip side of this is, we come back to cat, right? Here we're going to keep the structure the same and change the style to cat, and yet it still means the same thing. A change of style does not necessarily change the meaning, but the change of structure does. So what we want to do if we want to figure out the meaning of this cross and circle is we want to look at the structure of the motif, what parts are there and how they're put together. And that will give us a sense of what the people meant for you to understand when you saw them. So I would suggest that there are four elements to this motif. The medium, that is the material that you make it on, the circle itself, that center element or the cross, and for lack of a better term, concentricity, that is uh, how many uh, of those circles get repeated elements with the same center point. Um, I think that if we're a little cautious about this, we can say that a change in any one of these could at least potentially change the meaning of the whole piece. Uh, so, to begin with, we go back to the collections by Glenn Black, and they include 144 individual artifacts, individual pieces of broken pottery for the most part, and of those 144 artifacts, there are actually 156 independent motifs. Some individual artifacts have more than one cross and circle. If we look at the medium, what material they're made on, there are three materials. There is one that's just a cross on a piece of stone. There are seven that are made on unpainted ceramic. So we're making, uh, we're basically kind of molding clay to create the case. And in this case, you can see they kind of punched out a cross at the bottom of this bowl. There's actually four. There's one on each corner of that bowl. But most of them, 148, are painted ceramics. And they're mostly in this form called angel negative painted, uh, very distinctive of angel sight. And the large, flat, circular dinner plates with these painting uh, around the circumference of the plate. Um, so clearly, uh, the people at Angel felt that whatever message they were communicating, the plate was the place to go. I mean, that was the best way to make your point, the, the appropriate venue for making this message. Very, very few other examples in other uh, forms, in other contexts. The circle itself can be either present or absent. Here we have the circle itself. Right? Here we have a cross that's not got a circle around it. It has a concentric cross built in. Or we could also have a circle around the thing with rays going out. Now clearly when we see this, we think sun. And this is why earlier archaeologists believed that this was a sun symbol. Uh, but that's not necessarily, again, what the ancient uh, artists thought. They may have seen that as a very different uh, meaning. But we have three different variations here. And you can see the ones that have no circle, there's only seven. There's very few of those. But we have a reasonably even split between those that just have a circle and those that have rays. If we look at the central element, the cross itself, two of them had no cross. It was just a circle with the rays on the outside. Now, I included that. It's, it's a cross in circle with no cross. Right? Uh, we could easily have kind of just thrown those out and said it's something different. But because the rays are there, I thought this is probably trying to say something very similar. And it's, it's connected. But most of the time, we have just a straight bars to form a cross in the middle, 38. And then we can also modify the ends of that cross a little bit to twist them into a swastika. Um, and obviously swastikas have very negative connotations in our society, but for many Native American uh, societies, especially prehistoric societies, they were symbols of uh, of good luck, of good 
good fortune of life, flowing energy, and so on. They had very positive associations. So there's nothing negative about this. But you'll notice that some of these swastikas turn clockwise, and some of them turn counterclockwise. And again, there's more counterclockwise than clockwise, but it's not an overwhelming disparity. They're, they're fairly balanced. And finally, the last element here is this idea of concentricity. And you can see that some circles are non-concentric. Some uh, crossing circles have a second concentric circle around the outside. And again, a fairly good split between the two. Now, you can no doubt see that some of these variables presuppose others. You can't make a swastika without first having that cross. You can't have concentric circles if the circle is absent to begin with. So, in fact, um, well, excuse me. Okay, well, if you're going to make a version of one of these, any variation that we have, there's a sequence of decisions to be made. You have to decide to have a circle then you have to ask yourself, do I put rays on it or not, and so on. Um, and that, each one of those, for each one of those four variables, that describes a decision-making process. We don't necessarily have to think about uh, this decision-making process too much, but you can see there's two, in terms of this medium, how do I make it, what do I make it on, there are two decisions to be made. And those two decisions define three outcomes. If we look at the circle decision-making process, again, two decisions to be made that define three outcomes. The central element for the cross, there's three decisions to be made that define four outcomes. Now, uh, Each of these processes, each of these decision-making sequences, relates to a different element in the, the motif. If this element really means nothing, then all these different variables and all these different variations, they could be combined randomly. So, if this is meaningless, then we combine all these random combinations, right? There's three outcomes for one variable, there's three outcomes for the next, and there's so on. So we end up with, oh, actually, I actually forgot concentricity. So there's two outcomes there. Either you have concentric circles or not. Um, three outcomes times three outcomes times four outcomes times two outcomes. There's 72 possible variations that we could come up with here. Now, in a practical sense, some of these variations can't happen. Some of them have no circle and no cross, so they're not going to be cross and circles. Okay. Uh, and that okay, uh, basically rules out a bunch. Okay. Six variations would have no circle and no cross. Right. 44 of the variations of the 72 possible uh, would be on media other than a painted ceramic. And in fact, in that whole collection from Angel, there were only seven that fit that category which means there's just not enough for us really to study well. So we can get rid of 6 immediately of the 72. We can get rid of 44, not because we can't study it, but we can't do it well enough to be you know, reasonably certain of our conclusions. Okay. And we end up now uh, with 22 variations of that symbol uh, that happen on painted ceramic, uh, that seem to us to be sort of reasonably possible combinations of these states. Of those 22, only 11 variations are actually there in the, the material that we have. Which suggests then if, if half of the possible variations just aren't made at all, that suggests that the artists are actually very specifically choosing the 11 that they have. It's not a random process. It's not a meaningless process. There is real meaning there 
because we preferentially end up with the combinations of elements that have a specific meaning. The other 11 that don't show up would be analogous to gobbledygook on a typewriter, a random combination of letters that has no meaning. And we don't, we don't type that very often. So those 11 observed variations right, account for 83 individual motifs. So 83 motifs fall into 11 different categories that we can identify, which, at least in some sense, may equate to 11 different specific meanings. But I don't think that's the case. Um, so the central idea here, again, is that these variations that we see are meaningful. And in order to test that, to test that we're not just sort of seeing randomness and finding a pattern that really isn't there, I wanted to do some statistical analysis to see if I could get the math to support the idea that we're not seeing a random combination of elements here. And what these analyses are, uh, how to do the math is not particularly important. Uh, what's important is I took all that data that I had and uh, I compared it to what I would expect to find if, in fact, we were just randomly combining things. So the way I did that was I came back to this model of decision making. And I said, if it's random, then each time I have a choice to make, I just flip a coin. 50% yes, 50% no. So here I have a decision, do I have the circle there or not? 50% yes, 50% no. So half of them will be only the cross. And over here, do I want to add rays to the circle? That I 50% you know, yes, 50% no. So 50% times 50% is 25%. Then I compared that population to that what I'd actually seen with those statistical exams. And this wall of data comes out. Again, it's not particularly important, the numbers here. But what's important is this. The probability of my finding the patterns that I did, if in fact angel artists were just randomly combining things, is substantially less than one opportunity out of a thousand. In fact, at the original, uh, if I remember the original data, it was like one time out of every hundred thousand times I would find what I found. Which is so rare that the, the real conclusion is, in fact, that angel people were specifically creating some combinations and avoiding others. Now, what were they creating and what were they avoiding? Some of these, they're avoiding. See, we, you know, we would expect seven or eight copies of this particular outcome, and in fact, I saw none. Right? We would expect seven or eight, and then I only saw two. So some of them, they're actually avoiding. These are the ones that I would argue are gobbledygook. These are combinations that the artist would look at and say, that doesn't make sense. Why would we combine those elements that way? It doesn't say anything. Some of them, these four down here, we see substantially more often than we would expect randomly. So here, like we would expect this particular outcome one or two times. And in fact, we saw 12 different combinations, 12 different artifacts with that combination. Down here, you know, two or three times and 13. So these are the ones that they're actually intentionally making more often than they would have randomly come up with. These are the ones that mean something special. These are the ones that have a message that the artist wants to convey to his audience. So what are they? What are those, uh, those variations? Well, one is this ray concentric circle to the counterclockwise swastika. So here we got the circle. We got two circles. It's a swastika rotating counterclockwise, and there's these rays coming off of it. There were 12 of those. There were 13 of uh, simple cross-in circles with concentric. So here's a straight bar with the concentric circles, and here's a cross-in circle with straight bars, but there's only one circle. There were 13 of each of those categories. And then we have simple circles with counterclockwise swastikas, number nine, uh, 19 of these. And here's the circle, again with the counterclockwise turning. So we put all that together. The most common, the most frequently seen variation 
is this. A simple circle with a counterclockwise swap. The fourth most common is the same thing plus the, the right circles on the outside. I think these two versions mean the same thing. I think the counterclockwise turning is enough to have the, the basic core of that message. The second and third most common are these. And the only difference again between them is we're adding an outside circle. I think these mean something different. I think the artists had two specific meanings that they were trying to convey with different variations on these, on these motifs. These two conveyed the same message. And these two conveyed the same message. So what message? Well, remember if we go back to when I began speaking, uh, there are three different interpretations that basically fall into two categories. Archaeologists have said, well, maybe it was the sun. Other archaeologists and uh, many na modern Native Americans say, well, in fact, we're talking about the four directions. One interpretation is the sky world. One interpretation is this world that we live in. We can't tell between those two inter interpretations very often. People debate which one is the appropriate one. But when we come here to look at the material at Angel Mounds, what we find is there were two different meanings that the angel people were trying to convey. We as archaeologists, we as outsiders looking at this material from many hundreds of years later, confuse the two, and we've been trying to find one meaning for this symbol of a circle with a cross in it. But in fact, to the original people, it meant both the sun and the four directions, depending on which variation you have. One is about the sky, one is about the earth. If you're trying to say something about the sky, you use that appropriate symbol. If you're trying to say something about the earth, you use the other symbol. Any questions?